Good evening, and welcome to The Eclectic Radical. Uh, as always, I'm Chris Richards, The Eclectic Radical. Uh, joining me, as always, is my co-host, uh, Alex Suarez. Uh, and our guests tonight are Nick Carmack and Sherry Honkala from the, the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. And, of course, Sherry is also uh, Jill Stein's 2012 running mate. Uh, Nick, uh, tell us a bit about the organization. Um, well, you know, the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, you know, also we go by the Poor People's Army. Yes, of course. Uh, we're, uh, you know, an independent movement led by current and formerly homeless people. You know, they're really building a path outside of the, you know, corporate parties and political campaigns and the nonprofit industrial complex to, you know, really end poverty. Um, you know, we believe that uh, there's abundance and that if it's just shared right, there was the political will that, you know, poverty could be ended um, tomorrow. But uh, so we've been around for about 30 years. Um, Sherry can, can speak to, you know, the history and, and some of the work that's been done more, but that's that's briefly what uh, you know what we're trying to do, but I'm, I'm sure Sherry has much to add there. Please, sure. Um, you know, we were uh, we started as the Kensington Welfare Rights Union, which was a, a group of welfare recipients. Then we learned that there were other people across the entire country that were in similar situations. So we traveled around the entire country on um, what was called the New Freedom Bus Tour and started the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. And then um, we had to add um, an additional uh, name and really look at how to differentiate ourselves because um, there was the bars uh, Reverend Lily Bohess, uh, who went with um, Reverend Barber and started an organization called the Poor People's Campaign. And so, yes, that we were associated with the Democratic Party. Uh, we supported war, uh, took money from. So, it was very important for us to distinguish ourselves from the Poor People's Campaign, uh, we really been surprising that um, we to uh, the you know, group of peasants uh, in any part of the world. Uh, if we if we took uh, the Zapatistas, a uh, group of uh, indigenous peasants uh, who came and decided that uh, they deserve to land a fair to invite uh, um, for a right for themselves and for their children. You having a hard time hearing me? Yeah, yeah I can, we can hear you better now, but the, the last couple of minutes was harder. We heard a reference to the Zapatistas and the difference between uh, the Poor People's Campaign and, and uh, PPERC and the Poor People's Campaign is tied to war and the Democratic Party, unlike PPERC. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Um, so it's been it's been a hell of a struggle um, because the ruling class will only, you know, allow on, uh, you know, CNN or covers of magazines, you know, whatever flavor organization of the month. Um, and so what that does is it basically drums out our existence. And so, um, you know, we've just had to fight like hell, uh, make sure that, you know, um, differentiate ourselves because, um, uh, not for ego or sub subjective reasons. Uh, but because we don't believe in leading people off of a cliff, we think that we live in a country that things are, we don't think, uh, because we are the people and we're connected to the people that are not surviving this system. 
And so um, we're going to lead people in a direction that's about revolution, that's about um, addressing structural issues, is about um, a a system that is killing the world. Uh, We're not interested in a bigger and better or any system that does not necessity. So something I wanted to uh, to address was the um, international aspect of of PPERC. I know that there's been trips to uh, Venezuela that you took part in. I've taken part in trips there as well. But the first question I actually wanted to ask was um, about Assange because uh, his extradition seems to be pending. And I remember when we were at the DNC in 2016 protesting um, the Democrat corruption that was revealed by WikiLeaks at the time uh, that that uh, uh, Assange and WikiLeaks was a major influence over um, over the revealing of how the primaries rigged things against progressive candidates. Um, and so I, I wanted your opinion. I don't know if you've been following lately the Assange case, but of the influence of Assange and WikiLeaks when it comes to domestic politics in the United States. You having run alongside Jill in 2012 and of course been a supporter of the Greens in 2016. Yeah, um, well, first of all, he needs to be freed. Um, what's happening to him is absolutely devastating. And it's sad that um, we live in a country and in a world where, you know, truth is just not permitted on the airwaves. And, um, <clears throat> and yes, when you have, you know, in this country or other places in the world, um, you know, billionaires and <clears throat> where there's real no interest in uh, free and fair elections, um, you're gonna continue to see, you know, fraud happening all over the place. Uh, I ran for political office um, in the 197 and uh, I had, you know, I raised $100,000 in six weeks, which they said I could never do the majority of the donations were in $20 increments. <clears throat> and uh, I was taking on, you know, a corporate, you know, political party uh, and, you know, had uh, even, you know, the so-called, the Democrats in the neighborhood and everybody and their mother uh, supporting my election when I ran at the time. <clears throat> and, uh, on election day, uh, you know, people were just not allowed to, uh, you know, they thought they were voting for me, but when they went in, they just turned off the voting machines. Um, and people thought that they were actually casting their votes. Um, and I, I witnessed similar things in, um, in South Florida, when uh, Canova ran against uh, Washerman Schultz, uh, they used the, uh, the voting machine and, and the destruction of the paper ballot to manipulate the vote. Um, and in Philadelphia, it was similar, no? Yes, it was very. It was very similar. It was devastating. Uh, people had put a lot of their time and their money, and um, you know, just went through an absolute loss of innocence. Um, and then now, if you speak out or if you speak in support of Assange or the fact that fair elections don't exist um, and you're not just saying, you know, let's support the Democratic Party, uh, then you get uh, twisted and tied to um, Russia and uh, <laughs> some conspiracy theories um but anyway so 
you know, one of the most important things um, that we don't have in this country and that I've watched all over the world, you know, I was an election monitor, uh, both in Venezuela, I was an election monitor in um, El Salvador, and, uh, you know, it made the things that were happening there uh, look like a picnic on some days uh, compared to the kind of uh, fraud and corruption that happens every single time we have elections in this country. Yeah, I remember when we were at the Venezuelan embassy in D.C. In, in, in 2019 there to protect it from the uh, exiles and the Secret Service that were trying to uh, penetrate it. Uh, the late Kevin Zeese told a story about how he overheard the police speaking outside, uh, outside the embassy, and there was a change of, of guard, and the new cops had no idea what was going on, and so they were simply told, these people outside, they're untouchable, talking about the exiles. Mm -hmm. um, and they said the people inside, they're Russian agents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's all they had to have been told, and they would, you remember, Sherry, they, they blocked uh, food, medicine, water, uh, cut off electricity, uh, and the cops just went along with it because they were told that the people inside were Russian agents. Mm -hmm. I believe you were there too, Nick. At yeah, that was honestly uh, the most authoritarian thing I've ever seen in this country. Um, you know, we we had gone down as the Poor People's Army after they had uh, cut the electric and sabotaged the water. Um, which, from my understanding, was assisted by the police. Um, and we went down to try to bring food and water inside to, um, you know, and those untouchables that you mentioned, you know, they had directly stopped us from bringing food and, and water inside, right? They, um, at all costs, uh, weren't going to let us do that. And immediately the, the, the National Park Service, the Metro Police, the Secret Service, other law enforcement entities came over and, you know, w colluded with them to to prevent us from, you know, bringing in life sustaining resources. Um, it really was. It, it amazes me um, how hidden that is um, that. Um, you know, they, the police ended up going in later that same day, right? Um, and breaking an international treaty um, where uh, embassies are supposed to be um, sovereign land, right? Um, and, you know, because of the, the media being consolidated into the hands of, of six different groups uh, that nobody talked about it, um, even, you know, in, supposed independent media uh you know doesn't talk about it either they it's really comes down to where people get their funding as well you know what was his name the president of veterans for peace that showed up there uh, was it jerry condon uh jerry uh jerry with a g a gentleman uh, anyways there's footage of him being severely beaten by the secret service in broad daylight just for showing up to try to bring a zucchini to feed the comrades that were inside um yeah. so a lot of times when it wasn't the exiles beating us up it was the police doing it for them yeah and he's an elderly guy um and it and was barely anybody knows about it i wrote a book about it but barely anybody knows what happened in dc in those days yeah, yeah. they don't know what happened. Puppies. well i mean they don't know what happened in dc and they don't know that there was also a presidential election in which you know myself and Dr. Stein were on, you know, over 80% of the ballots in this country. And, uh, you know, the day of the presidential debates, the, you know, we tried to work, walk on to the university and participate in the presidential debates, or even, you know, use our First Amendment rights to, you know, stand there and protest. Um, and instead, we were immediately whisked away by Secret Service. And, you know, Jill and I were handcuffed sideways to metal chairs um, in a warehouse. And nobody on our campaign or nobody in, the in our families or in the entire country knew where um, a presidential and vice presidential candidate were 
uh, in the country for and several hours. I remember that I voted for you guys uh, back then. And of course, uh, for Joe once again in um, 2016. And I looked at the figures. It's interesting. So nationwide, there was uh, two times more people that voted for uh, Jill and Baraka. So the, uh, the Greens were getting some momentum by 2016. But actually, in the state of Florida, it was three times more. So that myth that in a battleground state you have to vote for the for the lesser evil or for the Democrats um, was not the case because you had a lot of youth that were galvanized by the green movement. And then you even had a number of uh, libertarians who were fed up with Gary Johnson that uh, went over to Stein's camp in, in 2016 as well in the state yeah. of Florida and other parts of there the country that found common ground. I. I, I hate to I, I hate to dwell so much on a mainstream media gotcha, but was there really a more embarrassing moment in the history of of media than what's Aleppo? You might have all thought it was a salad or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember that, talking to Jill about that in Miami. Yeah, but um, anyways, there's something else uh, internationally I wanted to talk um, specifically ask uh, Sherry about. Uh, we sent a gentleman to Philadelphia, and I was trying to work on a film project on this on this very topic on on Venezuela because I, I was an election observer once there too. But Sherry was there way before me; she was there when Chavez was still around. Um, Sherry, what was the nature of your conversation uh, with Hugo Chavez when you went to Venezuela? Well, <laughs> uh, which one? Uh... <laughs> I was, well, the one uh, where he's talking to you about how to help poor people, right? Yeah, well, like he I wanted mean, to help people a, in the United States, right? Yeah, I, w I was a guest of uh, the president on uh, two different occasions, um, and uh, it was very much surreal. Um, you know, I brought over a hundred people from this country within 72 hours, got everybody passports on planes and uh, to the World Social Forum. And, you know, me and a hundred of my friends and the hundred friends that I brought were um, formerly homeless veterans, um, indigenous, uh, uh, low-income Puerto Rican families, single mothers, uh, poor students, uh, people from Appalachia, uh, you name it. Uh, I wanted to make sure that um, there was real representation of um, the growing equality of misery, misery that's taking place in the U.S. Um, because, you know, there had been uh, lots of talks about how, you know, our government takes so much better care of uh, its elderly and its young people and, you know, all of this BS. And so I wanted uh, to make sure that we brought representatives to Venezuela um, so that we could uh, tour uh, different parts of the country and uh, talk with people ourselves, not hear it from uh, the president himself, but to hear it from the people themselves about how they felt about uh, the revolution uh, and how they felt about um, you know Chavez himself and what was taking place in the country. And I didn't, it didn't matter where we went. Um, uh, everybody was, um, uh, felt very inspired by the changes that were being made, uh, memorized the constitution. Uh, I took tours of the schools and I met third graders who, um, could tell you about what globalization was where I can guarantee you if I walked into a lot of schools in this country and talked to third graders, they would look at me like, what are you talking about? Well, it's um, like, it's sad. <laughs> what, one of the things that blows people's mind 
is when you tell them that in 1932, Moby Dick was fourth grade reading. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I remember in, in Venezuela just conversing uh, with average day Venezuelans on the street and our guides and uh, very educated people on many different topics. It was like a, a rush of fresh air, especially since I can speak Spanish, because you try to talk to uh, certain Americans about these topics and they won't be able to find the countries you're talking about on the map, let alone know its history. Yeah. But the Venezuelans these past 20 years with the social system and the education there, the investment in the social programs have helped to uplift the conditions of those people. Sherry witnessed that before me um, when Travis was still around and there's a continuation with Maduro as well. And we saw, and it was, uh, yeah. And no, it was just like, um, he was, um, I mean, just the best people, period, um, were just so absolutely amazing, you know, because I came there as a single mom. And at the time, my first visit, Guillermo was very little, my son. And uh, that didn't matter. I was, you know, I was able to take my son on, um, you know, their version of uh, Air Force One, (laughs) Uh, you know, helicopter and plane, uh, because uh, I had to have some of my meetings with him there. Uh, And then, um, you know, I, I wanted to bring other people with me to the presidential palace and he didn't want to have to talk to me by myself. Um, and so um, I, I met with by myself in the presidential uh, palace, but we were able to talk about, um, you know, how you know, how could um, we were together uh, to address the ill in both of our countries. Uh, and in particular, he was uh, very concerned uh, because they knew that they had uh, hope uh, in this country and they know that people freeze to death in our country. And so he was trying to be creative to come up with ideas in which how could we help keep families especially veterans in this country, warm in the wintertime um, when uh, they could, you know, get access to oil um, or whatever it is that they needed. So it was, Yeah, Chavez was a veteran too. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty, um, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. Because back then, you know, Venezuela had control of Sitco. Now it's been ransacked by Guaido. Yeah. And I, I was um, uh, able to, I was on his um, presidential television show. Um, Hello, Presidente, right? Yes, yes. Um, you should track that down for me. I and, think it's the one that had she, Cindy Sheehan. Cindy Sheehan yeah. was there, right? Yeah. yeah. And then I was also um, one of the speakers. Um, where there was like over a million people in the streets. Um, and I was one of the speakers at one of his um, uh, rallies uh, that he had in Venezuela. So, I mean, it was, you know, and then, you know, I was, I was a guest for like six weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, just had some very important meetings and conversations and and those kinds of things. And uh, one of the things I remember him saying is, um, uh, you know, Sherry, aren't you worried about meeting with me? Um, aren't you worried about being a marked woman? And I, you know, I just basically said, well, I'm in good company. So we both are. Um, yeah. <laughs> because... He spent his whole life being marked, definitely. Anybody that stands up to um, this country and this system is a marked person. Absolutely. And I remember how hospitable the Venezuelans are, how they treat their foreign uh, dignitaries and guests as uh, 
it's quite something. You feel very welcome there, whether or not you speak Spanish, because they always have uh, attaches and guides that are that are good translators for okay. different observers. Um, something else yeah. I wanted to ask you, Cherry, and you've probably been asked this a lot. Um, I heard you're in the Guinness Book of World Records for amount of arrests and protests, or if you're not in it, you're like almost you're get in there. You're getting there. It's been hundreds of times, right? What's the total amount of times? Do you do you have an exact figure? Well, I mean, I for years now, <laughs> I'm sure it's over this now, but uh, over 200 times. But I think the the more important thing to talk about, which kind of really um, shows what a horrible system that we have is, you know, I haven't been robbing banks or doing anything like that. Um, I've been housing people. And when, you know, many years ago, Frontline USA, um, you know, did a report in, and, you know, and their report concluded that I was one of 13 people that lives were in most danger doing human rights work in the United States. Hmm. And that was before, you know, me meeting with Fidel. <laughs> that was before uh, me meeting with, um, I don't know if it was before or after me meeting with Chavez, but um, it just shows you um, what a serious problem we have when we live in a country where there's abundance and, um, you know, it's leaders that are fighting for, like Assange, fighting for, you know, freedom of speech, where you have, you know, Jill, who will probably spend the rest of her life fighting the FEC, um, you know, and all these other entities for daring to try and, you know, you know, support independent politics in this country. You know, the more that you're hated, you're obviously doing something. Um, I want to ask you real quick, because we're almost at the the 30 yeah. minute mark, and hopefully you can stay on a little bit longer. I know Chris wants to probably ask you something as well. Recently, uh, Biden. Okay, I actually got to check on Galen in the hospital. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. That's your comrade. So, uh, uh, real quick. So, um, recently, I believe the total amount of the military aid package to Ukraine is now 60 billion. As you probably know, a third of that would erase all homelessness in the United States. And of course, Congress a few years ago uh, lifted the ban on funding neo-Nazis or arming neo-Nazi groups, which we know is in abundance in Ukraine, which is pushing us closer and closer to a World War III scenario. My question to you, uh, this money that, of course, the Democrats are in complete unison to send to these groups, um, and these groups, of course, in Ukraine also train the United Right in Charlottesville. We know about these fascist connections. So what does this say about the insanity of the imperialist system? That we're bankrupting ourselves to have higher interest to support extremist groups in Ukraine to fight Russia rather than find a diplomatic solution? Well, I mean, it says it all. Um, when we have... Uh, uh, children that are on reservations in this country and um, are suffering from uh, extreme hunger. We have children on the border that have been in cages and we have Palestinian children um, who have been shot at and killed i mean i could go on forever yeah. um something is really all over. wrong not yeah. just with you know you know you expect that out of you know the right wing and the nazis and all that kind of stuff it's these damn liberals um that uh are uh getting lost in ignorance um, and a very dangerous ignorance um, that's having impact on not just the poor in this country, but all over the damn world. 
and it's just absolutely devastating. So, you know, um, I've been posting a lot of those pictures where, you know, you have like a Palestinian woman holding up a Ukrainian flag. Maybe they'll come and support me now. Um, or wrong skin color. Yeah. Or you have, um, somebody that is suffering, you know, any of the homeless that are suffering tonight in this country or won't make it, or, you know, the thing I've been trying to make sure that I plug into every show that I'm on now. Um, and you knew Guillermo, um, he was, um, my son's father and along with, you know, more people have died now from the opiate crisis than died in Vietnam. Um, and the fact that we don't have those kinds of numbers on the streets fighting uh, to bring attention and call, calling attention to this, you know, new genocide that's not new, but expanding genocide uh, that's happening in this country is just absolutely devastating. When you have for-profit medical system, it promotes uh, pharmaceuticals, getting those drugs, getting those opiates on on the streets. Uh, it's, it's all the for-profit system in that regard is corrupt. Well, and it's a direct result. It's a form of genocide, if you think of it. I mean, we have a, we have a for-profit healthcare system that primarily invests money in treating chronic symptoms rather than curing deadly disease. Absolutely. And when you really think about that, that it, it doesn't matter whether you have a, a, a state system, a private system, a for-profit system, you, you already have a system that is deliberately choosing to treat chronic symptoms instead of curing deadly diseases. Yep. You got it. Cuba has a lung cancer vaccine. Yes. They have a higher life expectancy than us. People smoke cigars there. And they invented it during the special period in the 90s when the Soviet Union fell. They, they, have, so a, they have, and a lower, can't have access to that because the embargo hurts us as Americans as well. They have a lower maternal mortality rate despite being under an embargo. And a lower infant mortality rate in the United yes. States. Think about both of those facts for a moment, though. We have an embargo on Cuba that stops them from getting a lot of things and, and makes them pay more than they should for a bunch of other things. And yet they have lower infant mortality rates, lower maternal mortality rates, longer life expectancy. So obviously there's something wrong with the way our system is doing healthcare. Well, yeah, more uh, more people have died from COVID. More Americans have died from COVID than in Afghanistan, Iraq, Gulf War, Vietnam, yeah. Korea, and World War II combined. So more than any other nation, literal, not per capita figures, right? We're number one on COVID deaths. Yes, we're number one in COVID deaths, and, and that doesn't mention you know we're the about a million health, now. mental health aspect of you know with drugs, suicide. I mean, Sherry, I'm, we want to thank you. We see that you, you have to get going. We want to thank you for coming on. Always a pleasure speaking with you. You have a great night. Thank and thanks you for guys, joining. You guys have one of the most amazing shows. Keep it. That means yeah, a lot coming from you, Sherry. Yes, it does. I can uh, stay on here for a little bit. But just the point I was making is that, uh, you know, suicide drug ingestions rose um, between like two, the year 2000 and 2020. Um, specifically among like preteens and adolescents yes. increased by like, um, you know, a 4.5 fold increase um, during that time. And it's just. You and know, you've pushed my you've pushed my button now because this is where I always get so angry at all the experts talking about how kids not being in school is responsible for the, the higher suicide rates. First, let's be frank, most of these kids have not missed as much school as the people on the news would like you to think they have. A lot of schools have never closed, never stopped in-person class, classrooms. Yeah, I mean, across the world, there's a child between 10 and 19 
yes. that takes their life every 11 minutes. Yes. And, you know, that's, of course, increasing with COVID when there's the social isolation and everything. Uh, but, but you also see to, in, in, in this country where that, where that number has really gone up, I really think that more than more than staying inside or social isolation, you really have to blame seeing the effects of COVID all around you and knowing your government isn't doing anything to stop it. Knowing the adults around you aren't able to protect you because nobody's doing what they need to do to protect anyone. Yeah, I mean, and also whole, the yeah. I was just gonna say it's a whole slew of issues, right? I I grew yeah. up. I'm, you know, I'm gay and grew up in Utah, right? And the mental <laughs> health aspects of that, right? Utah has the highest rate of teen suicide anywhere in the country. And a lot of the conclusions that people draw that to is, you know, LGBTQ, LGBTQ youth. I believe uh, it. But it's really, there's a, this, Sherry said earlier, uh, you know, the growing equality of misery that's happening in this country where people don't see a future that's better than now. Um, you know, it's our economic systems collapsing um, and it's uh, not the obviously not the GDP and it's not and the capital of production, but the whole. At, I want to mention the, the revolution. I want to mention here in Florida, uh, the don't the ramifications of the don't say gay. Bill. They yeah. just had a high schooler gave a speech and he had to say curly hair instead of gay. He had to replace the words and that is going to result yes. in more teen suicides mm -hmm. because now they can't even talk about their orientation. Uh, so there was, there was a, a, a there yeah. was a, a there was a lesson in a history class in Texas where the teacher was complaining about having to teach the the pro racist side of the, the that's objectivity for you, right? <laughs> yeah, because you have because now you have to balance both sides of these historical questions. So now you have people making the 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 pro the the pro segregation argument and arguing the racist side of the civil rights movement. There was a big thread in your Twitter, Chris, and I'm sure Nick agrees with this assessment. Um, that was very revealing about why DeSantis and other governors are passing these insane laws. For example, yeah. here in Florida, uh, you know, I was tear gassed in, in, in here in Jacksonville. You have a vicious repression of leftist protesters or okay. BLM protesters. And then right around that time, uh, DeSantis was trying to push for the runover protester bill. Mm -hmm. This is post Charlottesville. He wanted Charlottesville on steroids. That's indisputable. Yes. Um, and it's, and it's pro, um, you know, runover protesters bill. And also his anti so-called critical race theory, which is really just taught in grad school. But, you know, it's a well, way to so, silence teachers from teaching about race. All well, of this is to prevent young white people yeah. from protesting like we saw in, in, in 2020 because they don't want the next generation to know these truths. They want so. And this is really what it comes down to. They do not want people who are not themselves racist, pro-capitalist drones. They want these, they want the, the people who are most angry about anyone teaching their children to be the people who control education for all because they know that they're going to see less resistance that way. Also, the Buffalo yeah. shooter had several images I heard. I saw at least one uh, that had the emblem of the Ukrainian uh, Azov Battalion. Yes. So he was inspired by that. He was seeing Democrats and others, you know, sending the aid. And and uh, some people have said it's, it's the chickens coming home to roost kind of thing. Uh, if nothing's done about these racist groups, if young 18 year olds are going online and finding out what Azov Battalion's about and seeing, you know, Washington sending them overwhelming support while the country's crumbling, while there's no baby formula. Yeah, they might go and do something crazy like that. There can be a correlation drawn, uh, drawn there. And also, I remember one time we talked about woke, right? Because yeah. the right wing always likes to attack the woke as if you have to be dormant or, or sleeping. Yes. Um, and then I never forget when Chris said, woke means racism bad. 
<laughs> yeah. a, can you make it any more simple than that? Like, well, yeah. If you think racism and homophobia are bad, yeah, you're going to get attacked as as woke. And it's just, it's even more than that. You got to be in your woke, slumber. You can't be awa awakened. No, what no. woke originally meant was understanding that you couldn't just vote this shit away. Yep. The black communists came up with it, right? Yes. Exactly. And you you had to be able to you had to be able to understand the way that capitalism and, and, and white supremacy support each other because the cops are the Nazis. You mean the pigs? You don't, you <laughs> don't have to worry about oh it can happen here no it's happened here it's happened here since 1877 when rutherford b hayes pulled troops out of the south so i'm glad you mentioned the cops nick did sherry ever tell you the story about when she introduced me to jill stein and in, uh, in philly in 2013 no no i'd love to hear it so she introduced me to her and we had breakfast together jill and me i gave it a speech the other day she approached me she congratulated me and you know, sherry set it up and um the whole conversation we were having was about um, the Inquisition in Spain. I always consider myself uh, studious on history. Um, and I knew that Jill was Jewish, so I thought she would be interested in the story. And so I told her, I said, do you know how cops were first called pigs? And, and she said, no. Um, and I said, well, uh, 500 years ago during the Inquisition in Spain, there was a division of the police called La División de Puerco which uh, is translated to the pork division. And what they were dedicated to doing was going to the homes of conversos, those Jews that stayed behind and, and uh, converted to Catholicism and making them prove to them that they were Christian by eating pork. Hence pig for cop. <laughs> of wow. course, cop coming from copper, but you know what I mean? Police. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I had I had no idea that was the Jill was pretty impressed by that. She's like, I didn't realize it goes back all the way to five hundred years. I'm like, yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's 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 funny how things work that way, though. Yeah, it really does. I mean, you can see. Uh, I feel like those who study history can see that the same tropes are just used over and over and over. Um, and really, how makes you think about reincarnation? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine somebody coming in as an activist? What are they going to do when they die? They want to go in, in the form of an activist again. You see those similar struggles. Well, maybe. On, on the other hand, you know, some of the people, some of the people achieving enlightenment may be the people we most need to keep coming back. Yeah. No, <laughs> I mean, maybe. I mean, I'm not a Christian, but, you know, Jesus was certainly a revolutionary, right? Yes. And, mm -hmm. um, was somebody that, was all about highlighting the contradictions of society and figuring out how to live a happy life despite the oppression. But it wasn't just about that. It wasn't just about being a good person and being based in love. It was about challenging the state and he was executed for challenging the state. Yes. And that's really, um, that's really what it is. And you know, how are you going to be in favor of the death penalty and call yourself Christian if Jesus was executed? Really good question. Yeah. Amen. I mean, it, it just it just makes no sense. It makes he no was sense. executed by Roman imperialists. That's one, a of the, one of the one of the handful of liberals I have a lot of respect for uh, is the the author of a, a book called Slaveholder Religion, which is basically about how white American Christianity is corrupted and is has nothing to do with with the actual red letters in the Bible and is instead all about upholding institutions like slavery. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. And, it, and really it comes down to information, right? As the, the information in this country is, I mean, before slavery till now has been consolidated into the hands of a few. I yes. mean, it, and that's the thing, um, you know, I don't think many people are, are talking about, um, at least not people with platforms, uh, that that really, you know, th there's this debate that's happening between conservatives and liberals back and forth. And 
They're it, fighting over how much money to give the Nazis in Ukraine. <laughs> exactly. Should it be forty billion? Should it be sixty billion? But nobody's then, saying, "Oh, maybe nuclear war would make the end of humanity." No, of course you can't. You can't discuss that. You can't discuss anything rational in Washington. They're not talking about the eight thousand people that die, you know, in a year from homelessness, right? Or or how to get solutions to that, or um, because yeah, one of the solutions is building power, you know, and building power from the bottom. They're already trying to scare China away from Taiwan by saying, "Oh yes, we'll we'll defend." Taiwan, if 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 the Chinese invade, it's like just uh, an imperialist move. That's that's all it is. Yes, uh, imperial lip service. Well, uh, let me ask you a good question, Nick, because I know if you've worked with a lot of heavyweights, if you're part of PPERC, uh, people that I admired that that pass away, like Kevin Zees and Bruce Wright, and recently uh, Russell Pell, uh, who was also very familiar with Sherry's work, uh, passed away here in, in Jacksonville. Another old time activist. Uh, what's the best way to to honor their legacies? Um, you know what? I think that's a, a good question. To I really think building an independent movement, a movement that's independent from corporate parties, not about funneling votes into the Democratic Party. And, uh, you know, in order to do that, uh, you have to make hard, principled decisions. Um one of the largest and most important decisions is where where you get your money. Um, you know, I've gotten to the point where I say, "Hi, my name's Nick Carmack. Where do you get your money?" <laughs> it tells that should you, always be the first question. You're absolutely right. It, it does, and there's a lot of good people that don't understand uh, the need to to be independently funded, and they it's because they aren't drawing on the experience of the elders that you've uh, mentioned or, you know, Sherry or, or other elders in the real uh, principled independent movement and are being co-opted into uh, the nonprofit industrial complex and co-opted into this binary debate um, between liberals and conservatives um, because people think that that, that's how you get the word out there. People think that, oh, if I can, uh, you know, speak to the masses through the, the ruling class mouthpieces, uh, I'll be able to have some influence. And it's just not the case. We're, you know, this growing equality of misery um, has caused people to yearn for answers and solutions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's not a uh, there's not going to be solutions coming from ruling class mouth the ruling class mouthpieces. Let's, let's remember some basics. If you get your influence from the ruling class, that means the ruling class can take it away from you if you use it against the ruling class, which means if your influence comes from the ruling class, you cannot oppose the ruling class even if you're Bernie Sanders. You know who I would because love to have on this that's program? That's where his power comes from, too. Not Bernie Sanders. <laughs> He's too bourgeois for my taste. No, uh, who I would love to have on the on the program is Chris Hedges, and I'll never forget the story. Well, it's a, it's incredible how close I was to meeting Chris Hedges during Occupy. Let me tell that story first. That's unbelievable. So I was at Occupy DC, not Occupy DC. I was there too, but I was at Occupy Boston, and all of a sudden, I'm saying hi to a comrade on camp. I walk away, and then that comrade comes up to me later and says, "Chris Hedges was here. Chris Hedges, where?" I want to meet him, right? This was in, in, in 2011. He said, that gentleman that I was talking to. I said, okay, where'd he go? You just missed him. Ah, oh, I would have loved to have met Chris Hedges. The guy's a legend. No, but one yeah. of my uh, favorite stories that Chris Hedges tells about Kevin Z's uh, during Occupy DC, uh, and of course, Kevin Z's one of the co-founders of that before they started Popular Resistance, was these move on people showed up. And Kevin was not one to mince words. And he went up to them and said, what are you effing Democrats doing here? <laughs> like, get out of here. Because, you know, Kevin was a, a radical green. He wasn't He wasn't going to put up with that. But, yeah, I mean, they they always tried to infiltrate. And they, 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 they try to push this narrative. And then they called themselves Occupy Democrats. I was like, what kind of contradiction is that? And now, what and now. It was to fight Obama and, well, both parties. Yeah. But, you well, know, now, it was during a Democrat administration. 
now if you study their 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 social media presence occupy democrat seems to be advocating for the occupation of some new country by the u.s military and have uh, nothing to do with yeah. wall street they, they probably want to send the u.s now to finland and sweden to defend their borders since they're trying to push world war three as well by entering nato no. i mean this is just insanity so it's it's bad enough that the original brains of nato were a bunch of unreconstructed Nazis who had been in Hitler's military and were in key advisory positions from the beginning. That's bad enough. But now you're talking about, we're going to let Finland in. And Finland was a Nazi ally for most of the war. They, they switched sides they at the very war with the Soviet Union too. Yeah. They, fit, they, they switched sides at the very end end because the peace treaty they signed with the Soviet Union forced them to declare war on Germany. They would not have done it if it hadn't. Yeah. I mean, to the to your point about the Democrats, I mean, they'll find anything that's good and and galvanizing the people and bring it into their camp. Um, you know, people see this independent movement yeah. And then the, you know, there's the Working Families Party to get people bought into the idea that there's this bottom up movement, but that it's just funneling people back into the Democrats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for example, you know, AOC, right? Somebody called me sexist the other day simply because I pointed out AOC and I said, look, the reason why I'm so offended by AOC, I know she's doing just like every other Democrat's doing, is because number one, she's a Latina and she uses that identity politics. Uh, and and num- and I'm a Latin, Latin person. And number two, she called herself a socialist. I'm a socialist. Have you ever heard AOC talk about Venezuela? She avoids the topic. I might have had she some does. differences with Max Blumenthal. We did a great job once when he confronted her over Venezuela, and she didn't want to talk about it. She said that she had to. Uh, what was she say? I have to refer to leadership, which is mm. Pelosi, who was supporting regime change and the puppet Guaido at the time. That's the so-called socialist. If you're a real socialist. You're an anti-imperialist. And let's oh, face it, Bernie uh, Sanders voted to bomb Yugoslavia. Okay. Well, this, was, so, this was one of the reasons the the imperialism of the of the Social Democratic Party. This was one of the reasons for the social fascism label that everybody complains about. Oh, you mean in Germany, yeah. Yes. The the Social Democratic Party had been committed to the Kaiser during World War One. Uh, they had been committed to stopping a socialist revolution in 1919. They were committed to working to undo the Versailles Treaty, no less than the Nazis would be later in the 1920s. Most people don't remember that it was that the, the first rollbacks of the, the the Versailles Treaty and the enlargement of the the German military happened when when Friedrich Ebert was still alive and president. Everybody Ebert worked with the the, the um, what were they called the Freik the Freik Corps, yes. were the precursors well, to the Nazis to assassinate Karl Liebig and and Rosa Luxemburg in 1919. Ebert, this was just a couple of years after the the uh, October Revolution in Ebert, Russia authorized the the formation of the fry corps and pay and putting them on the government payroll but yeah but but that's that's where the social fascism label comes from is this cooperation with all the worst aspects of the state right and i i think people don't understand the the power of the rhetoric of the state and the I, I wish more would study those strategies and how they're, you know, playing out now, right? Um, because, you know, we're seeing a full-on merging of the corporation and the state now. And, you know, the media, you know, specifically the liberal media or even the left is calling uh you know, all these Trump supporters, fascists, and, and, you know, many are fascists, but people aren't recognizing or, or at least talking about the fascism, the structure that's now imbued in our country, right? Hillary it's- Clinton was a Goldwater girl, and Goldwater was pro-segregation. 
Biden also has a pro-segregationist history. So these so Democrats, when they were younger, you know, I'm had gonna, these right-wing positions, and they've I'm kind gonna, of maintained them. I'm going to break in on Goldwater here, because this is, yes, in the in the basic the basic simple way to put it, Goldwater was a segregationist in, in the end, and you can't get away with it. However, Goldwater did not believe that the government could or should segre sh should practice segregation. Uh, he signed the first Civil Rights Act um, when Truman integrated the military and uh, and uh, allowed and when more voting rights were passed and things like that. Goldwater signed that. Goldwater was against the restrictions of the rights of private business to refuse service to any customers they didn't like, which sadly included segregation. And he believed wrongly, and this is where this is where it's important to understand that seemingly principled positions can still fold back towards this basic Nazism. He was so committed to the freedom of individual business owners to be able to throw people out of their establishments that he had to support segregation by private business. Yeah. Um, you know, that and private business is what runs this country, right? And it yes. has always will. I, I shouldn't say always will, but um when it always will if we continue to rely on electoralism well let's, we need to let's we need to focus that. on movement building we need to focus on counterculture we need to focus on counter narrative during occupy we were successful only at counter narrative nothing else nothing let's else. so we at least occupy was a primarily working class and class uh centered movement now we're into the identity politics and the division there um but we need something like occupy but that's so, so, that's, so, you know, I, I, I hate hearing people say identity politics because the biggest threat we face right now is white identity politics. The right uses identity politics. Not a lot. just not just the right. The mm -hmm. Democrats also use white identity politics. Yeah, they're an extension of the right, too. Yeah. Well, they don't think of themselves that way, and the, and the media doesn't present themselves that way. They're all the right, I agree. The corporate but, press, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think what Alex is saying is, in, unless I'm wrong, that, that the organizing principles around identity and the, the rhetoric um, is separating us from having... And, well, and this, this, and this brings me back to classes and identity, too. Um, it's Absolutely. Class politics is still identity politics, and that's why the label is kind of... I mean, in a well, what I mean by identity politics is that you're singularly focusing on that, right? Well, but I say, I say focus both on race, race and class because the they are inter they are interrelated. But, but nobody really singularly focuses on that. I mean, there are people who don't focus on either to the degree that they should, and there are people who focus on neither because they don't care about either. Well, there's people that focus on class so much that they ignore the. Um, the the uh well, the so, structure of racism and all that but that's but that's the thing they're not really focused on class they have a false consciousness because if you're really focused on class then you understand that the class identity of many of the people who are oppressed because of other identi identities is in fact working class and i think that there's many organizations that are funded through corporate foundations oh, definitely. to organize around specific identities who will provide housing for only women because their grants only allow them to provide housing for women and that's or true their people or different things and i think a lot of uh, organizing, you know, comes down to money. I mean, look at Black Lives Matter, right? Black Lives Matter after the 2020 uprising got something like $90 million in donations. They bought mansions with it, the founders. Yeah, they, they, you know, they, the ruling class wants us to continue to organize around narrow identities and to not have a movement. Well, 
against our economic system. Um, and I, I think that when I talk about or criticize identity politics, that's what I'm talking about and, and not the, um, not being willing to, um, work across identity groups to be able to build a mass movement to well but i mean that's the thing though is that you could you could black lives matter was not in any way and narrow focused on narrow identity politics black lives matter was focused centrally on the problem of police violence which affects the poor across the board and while yes it it heavily it, it significantly impacts black people out of their proportion of the population, it, it nevertheless affects poor people across the board. And also it was started by three uh, African-American uh, queer women. So it advocated for LGBTQ. Well, uh, they, so in that sense, it was intersectional, it wasn't just race. So that's that's true. In that sense, it was Let's positive. also not forget that the national leadership, including those people, those those three individuals, the national leadership is not the organization that actually organized and led the uprisings. The national organization is an organization that existed allegedly to collect money to distribute to those, those groups. But in actuality, a lot of the usual suspects ended up taking big chunks of it. Yeah, I mean, Trayvon Martin's mother you know, as criticized Black Lives Matter yes. over and over for like, where's my money from? Well, from the specifically, she she criticized the the people who raised money and made money off the, the uprisings by name. It wasn't even so much that she was critical of Black Lives Matter. She called out Patrice Coulors and Alicia Garza and Benjamin yeah. Crump and several other people yeah, by sure. name. Yeah, yeah. Well, Benjamin yeah. Crump is a lawyer, right? So yes, he is. Uh, but he, he's going to get paid by, by profession. Yes, but he, she has, she had a bad, what she sees as a bad experience with him. Oh, okay. Uh, and not, her, view, her view is that he is choosing to profit from the problem rather than truly fight against it. Which is a problem with pretty much every lawyer that I've come across. Um, there's a, there's a handful out there that I've come across that, do work because they're decent people but um you know lawyers Nick, like do you remember i wanted to ask you something now that i know you were at the embassy because it was so chaotic i didn't get to meet the whole group that came with sherry um towards the end um adrian pine who you know was one of the actually both her and margaret flowers were tweeting whenever they could get um on the internet from the embassy we need antifa here and there's footage of Adrian Pine coming out of the window with her Antifa shirt. And then, you know, Dr. F Margaret Flowers is, is, you know, tweeting from there. We need Antifa here to protect us. Um, this was shortly after Charlottesville where Antifa saved lives. We know that. We know from Colonel West's account how dramatic it was that they, that they very well could have been burned alive had it not been for the in intervention of uh, Antifa while the cops stood on the sidelines, uh, letting their alt-right mm -hmm. buddies do what they oh, want. Here here in so, Portland, an armed member of Patriot Prayer would have killed several people had he not been stopped. And the person who stopped him was themselves murdered by the government. Sorry of course. for interrupting. No, that's fine. That's a, that's a good point to put in. Um, and so my question to you is, groups like Antifa, uh, do they still serve a purpose when they're uh, defensive in situations like that where you have all the authorities beating us up for trying to bring food, exiles beating us up in front of the authorities, the authorities doing nothing. When you have lawlessness like that and there's no other recourse, uh, do, you, do groups like Antifa have a role? I mean, I think it's it's tricky. Um, for one, you know, because Antifa is such a loose network, right? Um, which is part of their principle as, as anarchists. Um, but, uh, they're, they're not, a from, from my understanding, this a core group that's always strategizing together. And I think some of that can, can end up being reactionary, not to say that Antifa is, uh, you know, all full of reactionaries or anything like that. But I think, you know, in, in certain situations, absolutely can, you know, 
be a, a great network to mobilize people um, to, you know, come at come at defense um, or or whatnot, like those situations you just spoke of. I I also think um, I think that I, I see a lack of a strategy sometimes um, amongst individuals that I've seen, and I I can't speak to Antifa as a whole, um, but but and th this isn't just a Antifa thing. This is you know more broadly in this country. Um, I I don't see people drawing on elders like they should who have um, faced conditions and faced uh, the political institutional repression um, that comes with, you know, the movement building over the years. And I, I think there's, uh, because of the lack of intergenerational cross fertilization, and I guess, and influence, um, I think the strategy building um, isn't always there. I mean, I think Antifa has had many tactics that are super useful. Um, and many other groups have, have great tactics, but they don't always fit into a strategy that's fighting forward. Um, and, and I think that that is something that's, that's extremely important. Like, what are we fighting for? What are we fighting to? Um, not just who are we fighting with? And I think, you know, automation has upended all of our society um, and has really created a, a new class of people who are useless uh, to the ruling class in terms of production. And I think that that's a new social force that can be um, capitalized on, for lack of a better term, um, to be a revolutionary force. And I think it uh, a lot of these people are backwards Trump supporters and a lot of these people are um, so-called progressives and uh, just people all across the political spectrum who are being dispossessed from the economy and have no relationship to production. And I think that, uh, you know, this does get back into the identity politics piece of, you know, whether the identity is Antifa or the identity is... Um, you know, LGBTQ or whatever. Um, but we have to find a way to begin to educate people on where, what historical position we're in in society and be able to think through what the ruling class strategy is. To Can't educate to people who win. don't want to be educated. Well, uh, Chase said in any, in any uh, on what country where, where there's an oppressed and an oppressor, there, there are conditions for revolutionary scenario sorry alex i i missed what you were you were saying at the i end. said che che guevara had said once that in any country where there's an oppressed and an oppressor there are the conditions for uh a revolutionary scenario for a fomenting of of a revolution and when you have the level of exploitation not just from automation but for the for-profit capitalist mentality in general um the potential for revolutionary implementation or plan of action is always there and if you only rely on electoralism in a way electoralism is the most kind of revolutionary force because it prevents through bourgeois gradualism or bourgeois fabian reform um the more rapid progression of revolutionary change which will come about through activism and, mil and movement building, uniting progressive forces or leftist forces. And, and I, I guess that's where I think we need to move past just uniting leftist forces and, um, you know, you unite the bottom, I, I think. And well, a lot of the working class is indoctrinated to, to, to worship capitalism, unfortunately. Well, there I mean, be counterculture so, as well. Well, here's the problem, and this is where. When you talk about uniting the bottom, you have to then dis you, you you have to then be really clear about who the bottom is, which requires the people on the bottom to be really clear about who they are. And there's a major problem of false consciousness. Um, 
there are a lot of people who are not not working class who are instead dispossessed small owner class uh, petty bourgeois if you prefer who while they are in a very bad economic situation in some cases do not see themselves as working class do not empathize with working class do not feel that they share the interests of the working class they want their they want their petty bourgeois status back yeah no i, I don't i don't think you're wrong i um they called them the kulaks in in the Soviet union right the rich farmers or the upper yeah. middle class farmers yeah well that that leads into a, a a very complicated debate about just how much propaganda was going on because let's remember that the whole problem of the rich peasant was one that the bolsheviks created for themselves trying to solve another problem and then they blamed the was left over from the czar then they blamed the peasants for it and yeah. and, and that's a good example not to follow it was um, really a product of czarism but to well, blame the peasants themselves like stalin did was counterproductive well and it, it, well, it was a, it was the problem of not being it was the problem of converting from a, a capitalist well not not even capitalist cre converting from a feudal agricultural system to a a socialist agricultural system. And do you know that in feudal times, workers uh, had more leisure time than on average the, an American worker has today. Yes. Here we have a capitalism which was supposed to advance from feudal times, which in well, some way the modern American capitalism is even worse than it was in feudal times in Europe. Capital, Capital capitalism is good for capitalists. What was that, Nick? No, I, I agree, Chris. Um, and that was my point is, is capital is good for cap. Capitalism is good for capitalists. And, you know, it's it's getting worse. There's I, I keep saying it, but there's really this growing equality of misery. Yes. And I think it's creating the objective conditions um, for people to make different decisions. You know, as people are experiencing, experiencing things they've never experienced before, they're being open to thinking things they've never thought before and for doing things they've never thought before. And I think that we need a form of organization that can speak to those material conditions um, whether those people are formerly bourgeoisie or people who have been part of the peasant class for many generations, um, that there is this economic parody. But that's, that's the, but that's the problem. That's the problem is that. So if you are from the working class, if you are from the, 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 the poverty class, which is shut out of, of, of work by the criminal justice system, by the, uh, by the, the, the system of, of forced unemployment, which prevents us from ever getting to real 100% employment, by all these things. If you're far, part of the poverty class that is locked out of even the working class or the working class itself, then you can you can you think that more social and economic equity is a good thing generally speaking some people just want to move up you're always going to have social climbers but generally speaking there is a class feeling to want to see more equity not just for yourself but for for other people in your position yeah. if you have social position already and everyone you know has social position already or had it. And you are economically disadvantaged somehow, but you haven't lost that class position in ways that matter to you more than your economic reality. You don't want social equity because you are afraid you will lose something by that social equity. Even if I'll it's never, not economic. I'll never forget what David Cobb said once, who's a Green Party leader. He's the one that presented Assange by video conference to the Green Party convention in 2016. He said at events once, uh, quoting his father, that money is like manure. 
if you stack it up, it's going to stink. If you spread it, <laughs> then it can help things grow. <laughs> and that's what socialists do, right? That's what you see in countries like Cuba and Venezuela. I'm not talking about Scandinavia. This still has a lot of capitalism. And you could argue in those Latin American countries, there's some capitalism here and there. But the point I'm trying to make is they are spreading that wealth to better the conditions of their people. That's why yes. they've been so resourceful, despite the economic strangulation of the U.S. empire. And we have yeah. a zero sum system where people are taught that someone else getting something and by people, I mean, white people, I'll be blunt about it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of anti-white here and I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not afraid of, of, of being so uh, complexion aside. Um, white people are afraid of, are deeply afraid of losing something. In many cases, it's something they do not have, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. And that fear of losing something means that they don't want to learn. Oh, Nick, are you familiar at all with the case? And we talk about him on the show from time to time, writing a book about his case right now, uh, Ambassador Alex Saab. I am not. And I, I will just say, preface, that I do have to run here in a couple minutes. Um, oh, okay, just yeah, real quick synopsis perfect. before you go, because it's important to research him. Um and, you know, we can exchange info later and I'll send you some stuff, too. Um, but, you know, you can Google also in your free time, free Alex Saab. Saab is like the car, S-A-A-B. He's a Venezuelan diplomat that was tortured and kidnapped and is now being held in Miami. It's very similar to the case of the four that we witnessed in D.C. right after they shut down the Venezuelan embassy. They use the justification that Guaido is the real president, therefore Alex Saab's not a real ambassador, just like they said that. When Maduro had invited uh, the four to defend the embassy, the four that remained, uh, that he wasn't the real president. So they're using this, uh, the fact that they have a puppet that never ran for president that nobody in Venezuela heard of before 2019 uh, to now go after diplomats. That's how they further their violation of international law. Uh, but yeah, it's important to stay informed on that because... Uh, not only could they extradite Assange here, they could continue to use their lawfare against uh, Alex Saab. So, yeah, if I, is this the one that uh, they called like a DEA informant? Yes, yes, they falsely accused him of being a DEA agent, and he was originally held in Cape Verde Island. He was on a diplomatic mission. Um, yeah, so uh, very if important was, to look at that case. If he was really yeah. a DEA agent, why would they be holding him? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people that they've extracted from Venezuela, they live in mansions in Miami now for informing for whatever. No. So he, he he would be treated like a prince. He I, wouldn't be being held and I being know tortured. How, yeah, yeah, no, I know how the DEA treats their people in, in, in Latin America when they come to the U.S. <laughs> they set them up with their own cartel in Mexico and give them a nice house in San Diego or El Paso. Right. And yeah. what you might not know, Nick, just before you go real quick, um, after Chavez died in 2013, the DEA came out with a story that Maduro was a DEA agent against Cabello, who was the other prominent leader in the United Socialist Party. Um, and of course, all of that was false. Maduro and Cabello saw right through it. Um, and what's really sad is if you go on Netflix, at, at least I would say at least 90% of Latino roles are, are drug lords. That's all the, the white kids know of Latinos in parts of the country where they don't have a Latino or Latina, Latinx neighbors. Um, so uh, if you look at the production, uh, they are full of DA agents. The producers, the writers yeah. of these programs on Netflix had worked for the DEA. There, A lot of them were retired DEA agents. Um, and so they, they use that propaganda to make the white man look good. And to make the brown man look bad, um, part of its profit. Also, I think a lot of it isn't to indoctrinate. Oh, Just totally like we mentioned cool. earlier, the Santis and the anti-critical race theory, so-called critical race theory, uh, trying to prevent the next generation from being more aware and taking part in the protests and in a revolutionary scenario. I think Hollywood and Netflix is also responsible for that. It's the same thing they've done, you know, to communists forever, right? Um, it's just anti it's propaganda uh to it's oppose cultural, anything, and i think the challenge 
the empire. Really, it's cultural imperialism. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a bourgeois American culture that's pushed on the whole world. Uh, what they so won't tell you is that Pablo Escobar's son revealed that his father worked for the CIA, mm -hmm. and they won't tell you how Noriega was the U.S. best friend when they have these programs yeah. that shows Escobar and Noriega. A lot well, of times they don't tell you that. Noriega was one of the people helping us arm the Contras. Yeah, the you know uh, the collusion between uh, for imperialism between media and government is so effective and is is not going to change. And that's why you know culture has got to be a big part of of the movement, um, whether it's to help people you know, bridge gaps between identities to make sense of, of what's going on in the world or, you know, to spread messages. But, um, you know, that's a big belief of mine is that art and culture really has got to be. Yeah, uh, we, we need, we need to, we need to take back culture. I mean, when people talk that's about culture <laughs> war as some kind of a distraction, they are forgetting that the very word culture war comes from, again, 1930s Germany, when Hitler was talking about Kulturkampf, which was the, the, the struggle over German culture. And they were trying sure to erase the German Catholics. Yeah. That it was properly, properly German culture. Which was Protestant, man. Well, and that's where it got complicated because Hitler himself was a Catholic. I know, he was a hypocrite in many ways. <laughs> He's not a very good Catholic, but he was a Catholic. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, but uh, but yeah, and the culture can't. It wasn't just Catholicism though, because Hitler eventually replaced the the Catholics as enemy number one with, of course, Jews and communists. And he made a very more vicious culture. Yes, culture. and and that's really so. When we talk about culture war, what we're talking about is a Nazi attack on working class culture. Yeah, and. Um. That's how we have to see it, not as a distraction, but as what the actual attack on our culture by the ruling class and their thugs. Yeah, like everything else, the the media wants to you know take words, twist them, and yes. uh, make them into whatever serves their agenda. Nick, are you on Twitter at all? I am not on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I I'm on Instagram at that shit's gotta go. And I'm on Facebook as well. I don't post any political stuff on Instagram usually because it's owned by Facebook and I was banned by Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I am active on Twitter as well as Chris. Chris has a pretty big following. Um, but yeah, we can connect on Instagram and uh, I'll definitely look you up after the show. I believe we exchanged numbers. I usually go through Ch Chamaco to try to get Sherry on, but um, I think I was given your number at one point or, or they uh, gave you mine. If not, um, you know, you could message me on, on Instagram or, or get it through Shamako. I know we were friends on Facebook. And That's we right. I'll just ask Shamako for your um, Instagram. your Instagram okay. info. Okay. Um, we encourage okay. you to join up with on our on our Twitter war, though. <laughs> it's not a culture war. <laughs> it's a different type of war. It's a working class war against the lies. Well, there's a culture war element to it in that, in that I am definitely opposed to bourgeois media culture. <laughs> Oh, if there's anything for culture in general, one of the most important. Uh, but yeah, no, I've actually been trying to get more in involved on Twitter, but uh, um, there's a learning curve to me. But trust me, there's no full free speech on Twitter, even with Elon Musk. There's I mean, no, the guy is a billionaire. There's, there's <laughs> no, there's no full free speech anywhere on social media, and there won't be as long as we have no actual comments, Amen. digital or otherwise. Amen. Well, and I, I uh, do have to run, but I, I really appreciate uh, chatting with you guys. Um, and yeah, love your show. I uh, have watched it many times. And oh, uh, appreciate it. Appreciate what y'all are doing. We appreciate we appreciate having a, 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 a another viewer. So thank you. Of course. All right. <laughs> have have good night. Peace out. I think I'll we're watch. starting to make an impact because if you have people that are like even one of Sherry's lieutenants that are watching <laughs> our show, that's pretty significant. Well, that's a good. That's he, a she good wasn't thing. joking, by the way, when she said 200 arrests.
No, I know she could be in the Guinness Book of World Records for that. No. I don't think there's any been any other. I think Gandhi was arrested like sixty times or something. So she's like more than three times more than Gandhi amount of arrests. Like I saw her get arrested in, in, I don't, uh, in the DNC. I, I, don't, I don't know enough numbers about how many times other people have arrested have been arrested. So I, I wouldn't. I, I well, the whole point of Gandhi was civil disobedience, which means break the law and get arrested, sure. get attention. Sure. And I don't even think he got to what Sherry has. And he lived a pretty long life. I think he no. died like in his late seventies, and he was doing activism throughout his whole life. But um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, let me tell you a story about when Sherry got arrested in front of me, because it's very enough. interesting. And then I'll go. Let's just go for five more minutes, right? I'm not. I'm not sure. feeling too well. Okay, so. Um, we were at the DNC. This is in 2016 in Philly, which is Sherry City. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was with her and like one other comrade in her car, and we were driving down because she was delivering um, beans to Bernie delegates. She heard that Bernie delegates were hungry, and she was bringing them a like a pot of beans, still hot, out the car. Mm -hmm. And so we run down there. And Jill Stein's inside. She got a, the credentials to go inside the DNC. Huh, so huh. talking to people. That's interesting. Right? Uh, and so Sherry's like, hey, I ran for vice president with this woman a, a couple of years ago. I'm trying to get in. I was invited by the Bernie delegates. I have this food here. And they proceed to arrest her. <laughs> and I offered to be arrested with her because I don't mind. I mean, I've been arrested a couple of times, but nothing like Sherry. She's an expert. Mm -hmm. And she's like, no, go out and rile up the crowd. I said, absolutely. I'm an uh -huh. expert rallying up crowds. Uh -huh. I didn't want it occupied too. She knew that. So what did I do? You remember when the people were jumping the gate? See, I'm one of the, the few that knows the real story. Okay. The reason why those people were jumping the gate is because they were pissed at what happened with Sherry. And uh -huh. I made sure they were pissed. I'm not making this up. I believe you. Um, there's footage of me on RT pushing the gates. But that was after I said some words to the crowd that got them riled up. And so I told them that there is a child. I was talking about little Guillermo, her son, mm -hmm. who who does not know where his mother is right now. And this lady ran with Jill Stein for vice president. And she is being held against her will by the authorities because she was trying to bring food and show solidarity with the Bernie delegates. I got them angry. They were already mm -hmm. pissed about the WikiLeaks revelations and how they rigged it against mm -hmm. Bernie. And it's unbelievable because it was the easiest recruiting job I ever done in my life for the Greens. Mm. It was a volunteer job, of course. I spent no money to go there. But it was the easiest recruiting job ever because people were literally running into the arms of Jill Stein. Yeah. When they later released Sherry, like you could see footage of, of Jill going like this, opening her arms, and all the birdie people running mm. and embracing her and say, thank God we don't have to vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, yeah. And then when they used identity politics and they said the first Jewish president, the first female president, I said, well, with Jill Stein, you got both. It's a two and one. <laughs> Can't get better than that. It's true. So it was not hard to convince those people. That's why I think that the voting, the machines, like, come on. There was more than three times. Well, two times is what's been recorded. But it was more than two times because Jill was not known in 2012. Mm. She was a lot more known in 2016. They even let her on CNN. Jorge Ramos interviewed her, asked her some stupid questions. Hey, you know, but you know, the Morning Joe, of all shows, had Howie Hawkins on a couple days before the election in 2020. Because they want to at least appear democratic. They want to at least appear like they're paying attention. Though, right. it, 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 obviously, they had him on so close to the election that it wasn't going to make much of a difference. But even then, even Morning Joe had Howie Hawkins on. They, they'll try to play these these sorts of things, but they won't tell you about candidates who actually have a democratic chance to win in theory because they don't have to worry about an electric electoral college uh i think and, sherry's our most important guest yet because not only is she important in the sense that she's been arrested 200 times <laughs> um but she ran for vice president of this nation and i can tell you she was threatened i mean you know, oh, I know. there's a reason why she didn't run a second time i'm not going to get in details Sure. But let's just say that Baraka it was a friend of Sherry, and he came forward, and she introduced him to Jill, and the rest is history. Um, 
But yeah, people should look up if they haven't seen this. Very interesting. When Jorge Ramos, who's a complete sellout, you know, he went down to Venezuela to provoke Maduro uh, behest of Trump, even though he was supposed to be anti-Trump. Um, Jorge Ramos uh, interviewed Jill Stein and Baraka mm -hmm. in 2016. And he asked them some of the most stupid questions, but their responses were brilliant. Uh, Baraka, for example, uh, you know, when he was asking about, are you going to go get arrested again? Like when you went to Standing Rock, are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? And Barack really put him in his place because he said, how many times was Martin Luther King arrested? <laughs> right. It's like, you know, political activism. And that's part of it. Yeah. That's what the word civil disobedience means. It means you're right. disobeying the law in a nonviolent mm -hmm. civil way, but you're disobeying unjust laws. Like St. Augustine said, an unjust law is not the law. Exactly. And so, and so, you know, Jorge Ramos was trying to make them look extremist, troublemakers, with his insinuations, with those with those questions, yeah, but their responses were right on. Oh, oh yeah, for example, Jill Stein uh, said something that nobody said. She said, "These child migrants, I'm sorry, these child refugees that are arriving from Central America, this is a result of U.S. imperialism." And when she said that, I was like, "Yes, finally, somebody saying the truth." Something Jorge Ramos will never say. Right, because Jorge Ramos will complain about Trump, complain about you know how he's unfair to immigrants, but he won't talk about how the whole U.S. imperialist system in Central America has instigated the crisis. No, so Joe Stein was saying things that no other politician was was saying at that time. He knows where his his bread is buttered. Right. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I want to thank Sherry Honkala and and Nick as well, and uh, Alex. Thank you. And I hope everybody has a great night. We'll tweet at you. Peace.